Hi, yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dick Shaw uh, from CAVI. I've worked there for 27, 28 years. I'm an applied entomologist working in biological control of invasive species, in particular weeds. Um, I'm also the Senior Regional Director for Europe and the Americas. Um, and what I'm talking today is about our international development work um, and the relationship between uh, collaboration between research and government and how you develop uh, plant health systems and support around the world, particularly in developing countries where many lessons can be learned uh, where we are. Um, um, we're also, I, I missed a slide, we're also members of the Crop Health, uh, founding members of the Crop Health and Protection uh, Agri-Centre, so CHAP, um, uh, I should have mentioned that in the slide deck. Um, I'm going to share my screen now, and then hopefully if you can just confirm that you can see <clears throat> that. Yeah, Looking for that's a thumb fine. up. Perfect. Great. Okay, so um, I'm talking about collaborations here, uh, um, and I will be drawing on the shoulders of many other giants in the in the field in Cabby. So uh, I'm, I'm, if I start floundering, then uh, you'll know where I'm coming from because I'm a, a weed buyer controller, really. But um, what I'm hoping to do is explain Cabby because we're a very very strange organisation, um, and how we go about acting uh, in the, in the field. And then I'll talk about our flagship program, PlantWise, which some of you may have heard of, but I'll go into it in a fair bit of depth uh, about what it has achieved and how it was set up. And then a little bit about PlantWise Plus, which is the follow on to PlantWise, understandably. And then I'll also draw on a few other examples. Uh, I've had to select them quite carefully in the time, but the bioprotection portal, uh, global burden crop loss, and you'll hear more about invasives because I can't resist talking about them um, in any presentation I give. So. Let's get going and talk about uh, what CABI is. So we're a not-for-profit organization founded in 1910. Uh, so we've been around a long time, aimed at providing support for our man, as it was in those days, overseas, trying to grow a, a crop in a certain place with uh, pest issues that were un, unassailable. Um, and we were originally the Imperial Entomological Institute. Um, and that's that's our origins. We span out to become a series of institutes, biocontrol, parasitology, entomology, and mycology. Um, and obviously we spawned a publishing division, which many of you, I suspect, will know, CABI Publishing and CABI Abstracts with 12 million abstracts in environmental and human health science, uh, the largest database in the world on that subject. So uh, we're not for profit and we, we aimed at providing support to the environment and agriculture and livelihoods uh, around the world, in particular for our member countries, which I'll talk about shortly. The main target is to help farmers grow more and lose less. The simple fact of losing, uh, uh, losing material through pest impacts and disease impacts. I, I use pest in the IPPC category, but I should mention, mention pests that include diseases and uh, weeds. Um, and uh, uh, using scientific knowledge and applying it. So cabbies, a lot of cabbies work historically has been applying other people's work in new areas. Um, not a lot of innovation in the, back in the day, and now that's changing rapidly through ICT use. Um, we work with partners. You cannot do what we do without massive networks of partnerships that you build up over many, many decades. Um, and obviously our main target is pr providing support to the sustainable development goals, uh, some of which we are directly impacting upon uh, on, in the slide deck, just uh, in the collection just below. Um, what do we focus on? Well, food and nutrition security, not just growing more carbohydrates, it's about nutrition too. Obviously, climate change is, uh, and, and biodiversity are massive, massive uh, issues, and they are uh, impacting upon public perception as well as uh, strategic movements and policy. Youth and gender, often overlooked, but now front and center in most of our, our planning. And then, of course, economic development, which flows through from that, and in particular through trade. So uh, I'll pick up some of those later. And the areas of expertise that we have. Um, crop health, obviously, can be renowned for that for over many, many years. We have DCE, Development and Communication and Extension, which is about providing the right information in the right format, in the right hands, to the right hands, for people to make a real change in their lives and activities. Digital development, um, with the uh, expansion of smart devices throughout the developed and developing world, it's possible now to provide much more information in tailored form through digital means, and that's a, a massive growth area for us. Invasive species, where I come from, which has been our core activity pretty much from the very beginning of CABI, and continues to do so, particularly through the use of biological control around the world. And then core to our activities is publishing. Um, our publishing division, effectively, CABI's turnover is 50% publishing, which makes a profit, and then 50% international development, which is not expected to make a profit, as you can imagine, given the subject in the field. And then finally, value chains and trade, uh, which is about producing uh, quality materials for better money to provide better support to the people generating it. 
And I would add in to that list of bioscience services because the institute where I operate out of in Egham is where it used to be the Mycological Institute, Imperial and International Mycological Institute, where we do various things with microbes. And we have 30,000 liquid, uh, 30,000 uh, isolates under liquid nitrogen. And we also host, for example, Fleming's original production, Fleming uh, uh, penicillin strain. So uh, sitting in that collection could well be the cure for all kinds of diseases, given the amazing ability of fungi to uh, become chemical engineers. But more about that, or well, not more about that, we'll do that another time. So what do we do? We produce books and ebooks. Obviously, it's a growth area massively in ebooks. Online resources you'll know about through Cab Abstracts um, and Cab Direct, and then tools and apps. I'll mention a few of them later, so I won't dwell on that now. Education and training. I'll give you a link at the end to what's called Cabby Academy, where there's various free and paid for services. Um, where you can learn and train and pretend to be a plant doctor, for example. Um, and that comes under uh, the education and training package. And then uh, lots of our more and more products that we produce are open access, including our new Cabby, Cab Ab Agriculture and Bioscience Journal. We've got back into journal publishing after leaving it for a few years. Um, so that's what we do. Um, and obviously with supporting professional development. But the weird thing about CABI is, or weird and advantageous thing about CABI is that we're a membership organization. We're owned by 49 member countries. <clears throat> um, and I'll show you a map, a, a collection of flags later. Um, and they basically, this, this particular year, we've had regional consultations where we speak to Africa, Asia, and Europe and the Americas to get input from our member country representatives about what it is we plan to do in our medium term strategy, the three to five year strategy. Um, and that activity, those regional consultations become a formal review conference every three or four years. And that's coming up in September this year where all of our member countries will send representatives to vote on CABI's budget and plans, but more importantly, what it is we're gonna do. And it effectively gives us our mandate to go out there and do the work that we do. And the work that we do is heavily supported by donor funding, of course, because of where we work. Um, and we're very grateful for the continued and sustained uh, support of those uh, those um, organizations, which I will reference as often as I can as we go through, because without them, we wouldn't function. And our member countries is a pretty broad range of uh, countries. We have everything um, from you know the A to Z pretty much, uh, but literally uh, the we have uh, China and India are member countries, for example. So we do cover a vast part of the population in the world, um, and they all have an influence on what it is we do. In return for a small membership fee, which equates to about two percent of our turnover overall, the member countries receive access to our publishing and knowledge products, as well as consultancies and free identification of pests and diseases, uh, if they're in the right category of uh, development. And the challenge which is the focus of the talk today, is about how we develop the strategy. How do we do what we need to do? So we have CABI core skills. We can't, well, we can build into that. We can grow skills. But what can we do? What does the political, environmental, social context require? Climate change is now front and centre along with biodiversity. It wasn't necessarily so a few years ago, so you have to adapt. What will the donors willing? What are the donors willing to fund and support? Um, the ideal, ideally, we wouldn't need donor support, but it, in general, that's how it works. And then, what is the member country wanting? And in some cases, the member countries want things that we can't deliver, and we have to guide them. My, my colleague in Africa describes it as a um, guided democracy. We're helping them get to the point where we can really deliver what it is that they need um, with the resources that we have. But the good thing about CABI is we have a, a truly global reach. So we have almost 500 staff now, around 21 locations operating in the field. And with that sort of reach, you have a network of partners that are it is impressive, to say the least. So that's what enables us to do what it is that we do. Um, the main centres are mainly in UK, Switzerland, Pakistan and Kenya, I would say, are the largest. Um, um, but obviously, we have well, there's a couple of sales offices included in there for our publishing products, but mostly uh, it's research. On to, on to plant wise. So this this was a, a thing that span out uh, from the beginning. We had a, a new CEO came in from a management consultancy background called Trevor uh, Nichols, and he saw a few. He did a consultation process internally, and he saw a small collection of plant clinics happening in uh, South America that had really high impact. And it's basically, I'll explain what a plant clinic is later, having really high impact, but it, it was something that could grow and be scaled 
pretty rapidly to service many more countries and draw in all of cabbie's capabilities so he saw this as a true one cabbie opportunity which was a rare thing we used to talk a lot about one cabbie but we never really behaved like one cabbie so you could bring knowledge products in and support and diagnostics and digital tools and all the other things so we founded this thing called plantwise which is a global alliance we just lead it we're not we don't own it um, and the idea is that strapline I mentioned earlier of lose less and feed more. And that's the, the goal of PlantWise, to combat the threats to agriculture of pests and help farmers trade more of what they knew, what they, what they, what they can do, and put know-how into the, into the hands of the right people. And bringing the science with the lab to the field, pretty much. So that's what this talk is about. And what was the need for PlantWise? Well, we all knew there's that argue, arguable figure of 40% of crops uh, lost to pests and disease. Um, it uh, doesn't matter how you argue it, it's still a massive number. So we're losing a lot. Um, the international trade is increasing the sort of the, the, the three, uh, I'm trying to remember the word is, <laughs> I can't remember anyway. The things that are driving invasive species, uh, which is uh, tourism, trade, and another T I've completely forgotten about. Um, and that's accelerating the arrival and movement of plant pests as they, as they, uh, and they hitchhike their way around the world. And there was clearly a big disconnect between uh, ground based the, ac the activities of research and what is really happening on the on the ground, and and the, the farmers aren't really getting what they need. There's lots of highbrow thinking, but not a lot of stuff that getting into the hands or the tools of the farmer. A key part of the information chain is getting things into the hands of the farmer through national extension systems. And in general, many of these are really completely broken, unfunded, and unsupported. Uh, with weak linkages, and that's what we found is that you know that the system's broken in many countries, and that's what we could could, could try to fix. So uh, the purpose of PlantWise is to act any crop, anywhere, any time, pretty much. Now the access to extension was emphasised by some studies previously, which showed that in some cases, if you look at the scale, there's ten extension agents per ten thousand farmers. In some countries, it's as low as two. Uh, in others, 21. These are the, of the of the poorest nations, uh, or the poorest supported nations. Um, and even in Ethiopia, where it was a relatively high number compared to the rest, you still had uh, access only at 30% for males and 21. So females are, are more disadvantaged in this process too. So clearly, there was a need for improved access to extension. What PlantWise did with Cabby's uh, guidance was to build that partnership. So building international capacity for people to, 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 to link with research centers and get the right tools in their hands um, and strengthening it through instit institutional change. And that's not just individual, uh, it's, it's, it's individual institutes, but with extension and research services, national plant protection officers, and of course, international organizations like FAO, International Plant Protection Convention, and uh, the CG system, uh, crop-based, uh, individual crop-based. Um, but obviously with the country support, and that's the, that's the challenging bit. Uh, the components of PlantWise, I'll talk these through a bit more, more detail in a moment. You've got the network of plant clinics that guide it, and I'll show you that in a moment, the knowledge bank that supports it, and the linkages, more importantly, between the stakeholders, and that's the bit that we facilitate. Now, a plant clinic, as was described earlier in South America, was literally an umbrella, a plant doctor, the lady on the right, uh, with, a, with a branded top on, and a hand lens and a prescription sheet, pretty much. It's just like a national health system uh, for plants. It's a, it's the, this is your plant GP. And the farmer is encouraged to bring his or her crop to the clinic for a diagnostics uh, to decide what the problem is and a prescription to see what you could do about it. And then hopefully a follow-up. Ideally, that you can follow up and get information when the plant the farmer returns. You can say, how did that go? What did you learn, etc. So the people who become plant doctors in the system are effectively always extension workers normally with a professional experience, but importantly, a strong communication skills, being able to communicate with the farmer at their uh, level of understanding or, or uh, language or experience. Um, and they have to commit to give the time. So these are not employees of PlantWise. These are employees of the government um, and, the, and the system is supported by the donor community. And we give them training to run the clinics and give good advice um, and build on their knowledge. And then we grow and access that. I'll show you how that's been done. Now, interestingly, when we first started, the donor community were mainly, interest, mainly interested in boots on the ground, action, impact. 
And the database, which we were trying to build behind it, was not of that much interest. It was hard to get the funding to support the database. And now it's turned out that the database is the most, the most powerful part of PlantWise. I mean, I'm, I'm not playing down the rest of it, but the insights that you gain from the data is pretty impressive. So we've developed a thing called the PlantWise Knowledge Bank. Um, and this is an online open access uh, thing that any of you can, can click into. And it, it can monitor the activities of, of the program, how many plant doctors have been trained, how many of them are electronic based, you'll see that in a moment, how many fact sheets there are, what percentage and what age they are and all the rest of it in gender. Um, and, it, and importantly, it's generated 12 and a half thousand fact sheets for various pest diseases and crops um in in the various countries and it's all obviously tailored to your country you say where you are what you're growing and then you can look <laughs> look up for example you get some background on tomato leaf miner tutor absoluta what you can spray against it and then it, the important reference point is this uh, pest management decision guide so it helps you decide what it is you should do what the risks are if you do that what the impact might be on the final quality of the crop or its acceptability in the in the supply chain um, and those are key key products and they're developed with the partners and with the farmers so sometimes you see things in <clears throat> in there like spraying uh powdered milk and stuff like that which we wouldn't necessarily have chosen as an initial approach to management but the farmers used it he shared it or he or she shared it with a colleague and it gets into the and this is the decision guide so these are, are very powerful tools and then behind that even further still is the POMS, the Plantwise Online Management System. And this is for the governments themselves. This is locked, locked away because the governments, it's their data. They have to sign up to Plantwise and they get the data and they can see where the, where the thing, things are operating, what pests are arriving and importantly, what they can do about it. So this, uh, this is, I'll talk a little bit about potential frustrations, but um, you can imagine this is the information where we know potentially a, a new pest has arrived and is moving. But sometimes the country doesn't necessarily want to share that because it may become a trade issue. So this, this is some of the frustrations and the politics in, in, in this sort of large scale activity is you have to just accept that and, and, and get on with doing what you can to prevent the movement or whatever. So um, I'll talk a bit more about that later, I think. So we move from the picture I showed you earlier with the, the, the female plant doctor taking a diagnostic and prescription uh, sheet was a paper sheet. We started off with machine readable paper products because this, was, this technology wasn't really there or widespread at the time to do it electronically. <clears throat> now we use a plant clinic app, a data collection app, which is very effective. And it's obviously massively increased the speed at which we give diagnoses and um, importantly, the amount that can be handled and, and massively importantly, accuracy. So you have a drop down menu of pest products that are available in that country, rather than the farmer's uh, plant doctor's interpretation of what a farmer just said as their local name for whichever complicated chemical uh, it is that he or she has been using or has been uh, uh, requesting. So that's uh, the, the data. And then in order to sort of provide more information and training and a little bit of fun, we have these educational games um, and there's two different ones. One of them is being a plant doctor. So you can, if you look at that sort of uh, cabbage, I think, and you spin it around and you can slice it in half, virtual knife, look at the, uh, run a few basic diagnostic techniques and see how your diagnosis compares to, you know, the reality, uh, what you would do about it um, and score yourself and see how you're doing and get more training and then improve. And then there's also a farm simulator app where you have a certain amount of money, you choose what crop to grow, you choose to spray whatever it may be. And, you know, you, if you choose to spray a red list chemical, then you can't sell your crop, sell your, sell your product. So it can guide you along the way. And it's, it's quite good fun to play. I'm a terrible farmer, I discovered, but anyway. Um, and then we have the communication app. So the principle at the beginning was to basically find a way of getting information from the plant network, like, uh, to, to learn more. So we tried to develop a, a platform which the, <coughs> the plant doctors could use to share information and learn from each other and share advice. And what happened was they instantly went off to Telegram and set up their own groups, like a WhatsApp group for, for us. It's, Telegram's the most popular in Africa. Um, and effectively, they did it themselves. It evolved naturally. And what we do is sit on there kind of lurking watching what's happening and seeing uh, how, the, how, the, how the plant doctors are doing, what recommendations they're making and how well they're doing as far as our professional knowledge uh, tells us. And in reality, in general, it's pretty good. Um, they're doing, uh, doing rather well. So to summarize the process, pharma comes to the clinic, <clears throat> plant doctor looks at it and they consult the knowledge bank to find out what's going on if it's something he or she hasn't seen. 
will decide what it is that they uh, they should be doing, share the information on this new identification, new organism, whatever it may be, new recommendation. And then institutional, you know, the government effectively receives the information and maybe has a pest alert, a new thing's just arrived, what are we gonna do? It gets flagged. And then back to the knowledge bank to provide information to the farmer now um, and, and advise the sorry the plant doctor to advise on diagnostics and recommendations and then the plant doctor goes away uh, the plant plant doctor the farmer goes away with a, a prescription of what to do um, and we'll look more into more detail of what has happened with those prescriptions as we as we move through so the plant wise clinic data into use why record data? Well, I'm speaking to a bunch of scientists, so I don't really need to explain how important it is to record data, but looking at the performance and how effective the recommendations are is important. So we've been gauging that ever since PlantWise began. And this is a Ghana example, for example, <coughs> a Ghana case study. Um, and if you look at the number of uh, queries that have been rejected, so basically we're saying, no, that wasn't the right recommendation. It was, uh, you know, you might have recommended a fungicide against something that is not a, a pathogen, for example. Uh, as as Plant-wise, gain as plant doctors gain experience, the likelihood of, of giving a, a, a poor diagnosis in, uh, decreases, of course. And over time, the, the proportion with which uh, that happens over years has improved massively over that time. So we're getting plant doctors giving much better recommendations uh, <clears throat> with fewer rejections or failed uh, um, advice. Uh, pesticides still remain a core of the activity and the recommendations and you can see a range of the amount of recommendations that happen. I'll, I'll give you some data later about how <clears throat> the proportion of that compared to um, non-chemical interventions. Um, importantly, I mean this doesn't show what I thought it showed. I'm, I've got another slide that shows the, the decrease in red list pe pesticide recommendations because obviously we, we don't support that at all. Um, but in this case, we're just showing the distribution of red list chemicals as they were uh, in, in the various regions. So we're trying, it's very low percentages, but we're trying to get that down to zero and it's certainly heading in the right direction. Another advantage of the, of the work that we're able to do now is drawing out a, a very big paper that my colleagues, uh, um, Phil Taylor and Rob Reader published recently in Cavi's journal, is the use of antibiotics. So <clears throat> a surprising level of antibiotic recommendations through the plant-wise system the bacterial diseases, often prophylactic, um, was was discovered, um, and there's a there's definite concern. The anti antibiotic resistance group are very interested in this because it's obviously getting it into the supply chain and potentially affecting uh, resistance throughout the chain, uh, human and animal. Um, so quite quite a worrying. And when you discover that, I think it was a kilo of whichever erythromycin or something was about five dollars. It was incredibly cheap to apply and it was surprisingly cheap. So uh, I think that's what's driving it. Um, so what is it done? So, whoops. So over the time, let's uh, click that, I think. Oh no, what am I doing? There we are. So you, it started small back in 2011. You get a few countries starting off, they gaining experience. Neighboring countries are finding a little bit about it. They're talking to us about what it is we can do. What does it mean? How does it interact with their systems? <clears throat> What data will they get? Getting data agreement policies about us being able to access the data that belongs to the country. It all takes time to build. Can you do you have the infrastructure there? How much training is required? Um, what's the scalability from from region to country? And as it starts to pick up, then it suddenly accelerates. The speed at which you're reaching farmers through whichever technique you, you find has massively increased to over 54 million now. And the way um, that's achieved is you can. It's a balance between having reach with low impact. So radio campaigns, people may or may not listen to, may listen to and not implement. And then at the other end of that scale, where you have massive impact, but very small reach would be like farmer field schools or uh, on, on farm consultations where it's one-to-one. -one. Um, obviously farmers share information amongst farmers. So it's quite important to do that. And what we found one of the sweet spot is probably plant health rallies where you have a particular pest, a particular issue, and you have a plant health rally at, normally a market and then people come to listen and they spread the word throughout that so you can have hundreds of people at these rallies and you announce them in advance uh, through the local radio and you can have quite a good impact and, and get feedback as well at the same time so that's that's the challenge is getting that and obviously conveying the information that we have scientific information and knowledge to those people to to implement 
So what's happening? This is a summary of an awful lot of <laughs> effort and time. Um, one of the things that we did have included in PlantWise and very heavily funded was a monitoring and evaluation program where we, we fund external evaluators to come in and assess the impact of, of the PlantWise program to reassure uh, the donors that they're getting good value for money. And what we found is, you know, massive uh, numbers of reporting yield increase, income increase, obviously associated with yield increase, and half the plant clinic prescriptions recommending non-chemical inputs. That was a big, big move. I mean, an impressive shift from where it was. We still have a relatively low number of plant-wise doctors being female, but that's you know, a, a regional issue and is increasing. Um, and private sectors become key, and I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a moment. So one of those studies I've just pulled out would be the May study in Rwanda, where what you can see here to summarize, you've got non-users and users very carefully selected within the same region, um, but not actually receiving plant-wise information or, or, or accessing it. And then what you'll see is the input cost for the users is higher. They're spending $52 per hectare instead of 38. And that's you can see how it's broken down be, between pesticide seed and fertilizer, lower seed, interestingly. Um, so the total cost is higher, but the yield in kilograms per hectare is much higher, almost 30% higher. And the cost per tonne is 22% lower. So you've got this net in income increase of around $70 a hectare for a farmer in, in developing country situation. That is a, a pretty massive Im improvement. So um, this has obviously been very well received. And I think PlantWise has reached that point where at the beginning it was, it was a very easy win. You had people gaining information from agro input suppliers who are selling whatever they're chemical they've got left in their cupboard uh, that hasn't sold yet and in some cases spraying fungicide against spiders so you've got this terrible mismatch <clears throat> and it's very easy to rapidly reduce the input and increase the the, uh, the productivity in that disastrous situation but um, but as you can see there's definitely change in, in behaviors so people uh, uh, plant clinics and, and users are getting better information they're adopting new practices and their productivity is going up so uh, a real plus, and as a result, PlantWise has won uh, quite a few awards along the way, some quite prestigious ones. So how do we go about this? What, what, what is the key to this? So you need uh, the collaboration needs regarding data. So you've got, you've got to understand it's national ownership of plant clinic data. They get the data and they own it and they decide what to do with it. And once you understand that, it makes life a lot easier. You can't expect, as a, you know, as a scientist, you want access to all the data and you want to be able to work it as you like. Um, what we really try to encourage is we don't have parallel systems. So the country has its own system for managing and organizing the data and, and interpreting it and collating it. And we have our own too. We try and encourage them to use our system or you know, have access to ours. But it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collaboration. Um, working out how to manage and control those data, because that can go terribly wrong very quickly. Um, and letting them do what they want with it and interpret it as they wish. And that's, that's just, a, you know, we're here to provide a service, not to, not to govern. Um, and it's really important to understand that local institutional, cultural, all the things that, that make a country a country and the people within the country, the people, you have to understand that and build those linkages and understand that there'll be turnover and people leave jobs and uh, infrastructure support collapses and then is reinvested in. You have to just ride that out and build those long-term relationships. Um, and you've got to keep doing it at a very uh, local level and also at the very highest level to make sure that the country understands the service it's receiving and everything else. <clears throat> so what has happened at a country level, which is more regarding what the talk's title uh, relates to, is, for example, in Myanmar, we've basically helped establish a national plant health strategy. In Jamaica, uh, it's, it's now implemented into existing agricultural advisory services. The success of PlantWise is when donor funding and PlantWise isn't needed anymore. The country has adopted the system and it's theirs and it funds it forever. That's the dream scenario of, of, of PlantWise. That's what success would look like. Um, we were able to spread information on fall armyworm very quickly in Kenya. We've got a, 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 a demonstration which shows how they arrive. You know, fall armyworm was detected. We knew it was coming. Detected in various plant clinics long before the literature reflects it or government policy enacts any action. So, that, I mean, that's just how it normally works. It takes a long time to move. But having said that, in Sri Lanka, the arrival of, uh, of the banana skipper, this was detected in a plant clinic and within two days there was an eradication program established by the government because they kind of knew it was coming and they were well prepared. And as a result, <coughs> we helped prevent 
well, plant-wise help prevent the loss of up to 13 thousand metric tons and around 20 million dollars of return each year by getting in there early and eradicating so that's a, a pretty major success story and just i did mention the plant the um private sector clearly uh, you can't operate solely without the private sector and in many countries especially asian countries there's been good engagement with the private sector uh, for example private sector organizations providing plant clinic staff um, using the system as a monitoring tool to ensure that agro input suppliers are recommending non-chemical or integrated approaches so uh, the private sector has certainly engaged and what we expected to happen what we feared might happen when private sector engagement is that the uh, recommendations might be biased towards the sponsor or the chemical company or whatever it may be and it turns out that they were absolutely the same in the reviews that we did the recommendations were the same as non non-private uh, government supported uh, recommendations so Building on that success, I'm going to check my time. Yep, okay. Um, what next? Well, PlantWise Plus, of course, is what's next. And learning from what we've uh, what we've done, we're focusing still on that predict, prepare, uh, prevent, predict, prepare. So prevent them getting in, predict what might be coming in, be prepared for it. So it's that early intervention, which I'll talk about with bio uh, invasives in a moment. So strengthening systems for detection. So we have a priorities, and this is this is linking pest risk mapping and earth observation and modeling to predict what's coming in. And I'll, the PRISE project, P-R-I-S-E, is a good example of that, which you could look up <clears throat> so that they can plan and prepare for crop health flats like fall armyworm or the next fall armyworm, which is the one that was the real game changer for us. Then there's climate smart advisory tools. So what to grow where, how to react to potential climate shocks. Um, and decent practices. So digital tools and learning, allowing them to monitor and also market intelligence systems, what, what the market's doing and how the crop production might change. Uh, safer plant protection products, this links with the next one. So this is about getting using the right products in the right area. The whole world is shifting away from uh, synthetic chemicals into integrated and uh, nature-based solutions, as we call them. Um, and that's something that needs support. And sometimes they, you know, they need more care in application and uh, utilization. So that's something we're there to su provide support for. And also the importance of quality products, not, not least for domestic markets, where often export markets are very, very tightly controlled in chemical pesticide residue, et cetera, but domestic markets are less so, and that's changing rapidly too. So uh, some of those valuable internal markets are ones that need to be, uh, need to be focused upon. Um, and obviously, we're closely aligned with uh, with global uh, SDG and government and donor goals in looking after climate, women and agriculture, youth, uh, engagement with agriculture, because you can't operate without them, uh, and creating employment. So uh, a safer future plant health system has countries working together, um, creating regional and national plant advisory services producing more better quality and safer foods that's the dream um, and we should be able to predict those future health threats and prevent them using smart surveillance um, and making sure that we deal with them as before or as they arise and be ready to act rapidly at scale that's the bit that's the really hard bit is once it gets out a new pest or a new disease then they spread very very rapidly and it's very hard to control them so better quality and better quantity. And of course, SDGs all. So we end up with happy farmers. That's that's the ultimate result. Happy, more wealthy, and but with better livelihoods. That's the idea. So that I'm going to leave plant-wise there for a moment in the interest of time and move through to uh, another initiative, which is about uh, for governments to make uh, advised decisions and where to invest. Uh, they need to have data and information, and often that's economic data. Is it worth me getting involved in this activity? What's the cost benefit for me or for the country and the people? And here's an example we're working on at the moment called Global Burden of Crop Loss. Um, and what it aims to do is to work out what's being lost to where, how are they being lost, and what can we do about it? It's the ultimate goal, but that's not the part of this project. So initially it was at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Fund to get people to work together to work out what data-driven systems we can use to assess the scale and impact of crop loss. Um, and then that would direct funding policy and research efforts. So the idea is, you know, once you have that evidence, what happens next? And this is building very much on <clears throat> the global burden of disease and human health. 
So in really brief summary, in 25 years ago, did this effort came about to look at what people were dying from, or the disease is called a uh, disease adapted life years. So what effectively, uh, what was the burden of disease on a country's people and productivity effectively? So they started off with very, very little data. It really wasn't, wasn't available. And what they did was they, they populated an estimate based on neighboring countries or you know, expert knowledge, whatever it might be, and they published how many kids are uh, ill or dying from diarrhea before the age of five or in childbirth at whatever age. And so they generated these data and it was, you know, there was errors all over the place, of course, because it was an estimate. But it, what it did was focus countries' minds to say, hang on, we don't agree with that. We'll generate some data that will prove what the real number is. And it grew and grew and grew and it had significant funding to do so. And now you can find out how many people are dying of whatever disease in whichever country. And global organizations and countries can direct support to those regions to address malaria or whatever the disease may be. So it was a massive success story, huge, huge data collect collection activity um, and interpretation activity. So that was massive. There's an a, a animal disease version happening at the moment, um, led by University of Liverpool, which could be equally as effective and, and important. And obviously, we're, we're coming up behind with the crop one, but these are the areas where significant funding is applied. Obviously, human health and animal health tend to trump plant health. We all know that in this audience, um, but we're hoping to do something about that. And the simple principle of it with the partners here, you can see University of York, Exeter, Luma Consulting, <coughs> my PPC, uh, is to work out what that yield envelope could be. So you're growing a certain crop in a certain area based on the weather, how much water is available, what events have happened, what the nutrient, not events, uh, what nutrient availability and the, and the factors around what's available, what could you produce per hectare? And then you look at what's being lost. So how much is being lost to biotic and abiotic threats, uh, shock events, pest disease, and what those, the value of those losses are versus your yield envelope. And then you've got your control measures. What are you putting in to make sure that your crop is as healthy as possible? And how much does that cost? Put them together. And that's the burden. Um, that's the principle of it. And here's a mock-up of what that might look like for wheat, which is the one we're focusing on at the moment. And here you can see uh, a map of where the losses are, what they're being lost to. You can look into more detail about what specific organisms are causing the loss and also a feed on what information is out there. And you can do it by year, by crop, what type of loss and what region or country. So this is this is what we hope to be able to do with adequate funding. At the moment, what we're doing is looking at a proof of concept for wheat, pretty major crop, and then building methodology that is transferable, um, um, of course, and then a, a tool for people to explore. So uh, watch this space. This could be quite an influential uh, activity. And then I'm heading towards the end now. So we've got uh, a bioprotection product. So once you sometimes you can operate with less government involvement. Um, and this is about uh, the Cabby Bioprotection Portal, which is aimed at providing information, uh, unbiased information on uh, bioprotection products that are non-chemical. Um, and the idea is that you could be in a country with a certain crop. I am working on coffee, growing coffee, and I want to look at this pest problem. What have I got available? Well, there's there's 95 products available, but in your category, it's a certain number. And here's one, for example, Javelin. And then you can click in and find out the data sheet, what you can target it against, how best to apply it. Um, and the idea is that it's free to you. So once you have uh, your information, it's funded by a series of partners who are uh, pr producers, obviously, of the of the organ of the uh, products in the in the portfolio. <clears throat> but it's uh, the data is provided by the governments. So you have the, whatever's registered in the country is on the list, and then the information is sought by our team in in Cabe. So yeah, that's another useful tool, and it's growing, you know, by the day. Literally, new countries being added, new products being added, new partners. Uh, and on to invasives. So finally, I've got five minutes. Uh, it's a global issue and it's costing billions. Uh, these are invasive species. I, I work on plants, but it's also pests and disease. Uh, it affects millions of people. Uh, it's killing livestock and livelihoods, in particular the Apuntia there. Um, and it is driving people into conflict. So various species of plants have been have been distributed around like Prosopis in, uh, under aid programs, unfortunately, and it's displacing normally nomadic tribes folk into conflict with other nomadic tribes folk, and they're killing each other literally over a weed. So this is this is the sort of scale of problems we have around the world. And it's disproportionate. So 100 million women spend 20 billion hours weeding every year. 
um, and 70% of children miss school to, to help with that weeding process on family farms. So this is having a massive social impact um, and uh, hopefully something could be done about it. And this is your classic invasion curve. Uh, I should have a reference to that. I apologize, it's not on there. Um, so you've got your invasion arrival, the curve, it starts off low, very few or absent at the beginning. Then it, as areas occupied increases, so does the per capita biodiversity impact on the right column, uh, right uh, axis. Um, so you have options of activity and the cost benefit for those change over time. And the obvious one is prevention. If you stop it getting in, you can stop the problem arising and you can have a result. You know, that you never got here is not a big problem. If you've got it early, you can early detect and rapid response it's called, and then you can get in, kill it, control it, remove it, and then you've, your, your curve drops away to zero again. Then you've got that very narrow window pretty much because it's an exponential growth normally with invasive species, and then you're into the management phase, and that's the hard one. You're stopping spread or you're accepting it and mitigating or changing your procedures or, or practices or just throwing your hands up in the air and giving up. Um, one of the things that bucks the trend here in that management thing with the economic return is biological control, of course. Um, and if you do use it, then you can have an impact with very little cost and permanent control. Uh, highly specific natural enemies for classical biocontrol, specific natural enemies in the native range of the weed. In, the, in this case, I'm talking about weeds, but the example, there's been an awful lot of biocontrol going on around the world against insects. Most of those 7,000 introductions are insect uh, against insects. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about weeds because that's my subject. It's based on the enemy release hypothesis, take away the pests, the weed grows stronger, harder, faster, whatever it may be. You know, it's the same as controlling pests in a crop. And the theoretical process, you have your population problem, <clears throat> the high bar with the um, oscillation around uh, you know, population uh, change over time, brief time. And then once you introduce your biological control agent, you have a slow suppression below what you might classify as an economic or environmental threshold, the green line. And that persists off into, in my case, the road around the corner. Um, so that's, that's what successful biological control looks like. And I'm going to use, this is an Asian picture, but this is water hyacinth, very famous weed, was on the list in the UK uh, for, for, for the European list of, of species. It will probably come off the list very soon for the UK with Brexit. Um, but is a massive is issue in Portugal and Spain, for example. And this has been the benef benefit of using biocontrol. Neocatina, two species of weevil were introduced uh, with great success around the world. And here's the real data from that theoretical uh, graph I showed you earlier. And you can see these are sort of 140,000, oh, sorry, 1.4 million, 1.6 million acres of invasion, excuse the, uh, the, the, the uh, acres rather than hectares in Louisiana. So you can see the scales can be very large and the effect can be very large and continued. And then here we have uh, a climax community eucalypt forest in Australia, which, you know, theory, theory would tell you is fairly uninvadable, pretty much most niches filled unless you climb over the top of it. And here we have rubber vine from Madagascar. And this was uh, basically introduced for latex actually uh, originally and has just been an absolute disaster. Uh, covering 40,000 square kilometers, um, twice the size of Wales, bigger than Belgium, choose your country. <clears throat> and this would be considered by some ecologically as uh, irreversible and a novel ecosystem. But those are people who haven't used biocontrol and we were able to find a, a rust fungus from Madagascar, which has since been released and is now controlling that weed across the whole of that range. So an amazing continent scale impact. Unfortunately, though, it's not always successful. About a 30 to 35 percent of releases get established and have impact. Uh, when it's well funded, it's better. And we're not really in the old days. They released anything anytime, and they, you, know, you have a low low rate of success. Now it's much more tailored. Um, and the Australians quote 80 percent success rate when the cost reductions are, are more, savings are more than the cost of the investment in biocontrol. So, so pretty pretty effective. Any economist will tell you this is exactly the right thing to do. But politically, this is a big big step. And in Europe, there'd been almost no biocontrol releases when we first got involved. Um, and now that's increasing rapidly. Um, but it's taken a long, long time. Um, without doing biocontrol, what's the alternative? Well, doing nothing's not a low risk option. In most cases, doing nothing is a low risk option. But in this case, the weed continues to spread, the invasives continues to spread. Um, and not considering all the tools available can be a problem. And here's an example of exactly that, where this is a benign, this, this this um, this project dismissed by control immediately as being irresponsible, I quote, um, but they decided that 
this benign <laughs> impact on the bank here. Uh, removing manually was the way to go, and that was a much more suitable solution, ignoring all the things that are in there as it's getting dumped into the lorry. Um, and they spent 23 million euros, and then of course it came back, and then they spent another 5 million and it's still there. So this is a basic waste of money and should never have happened. And perhaps spending a very small proportion of that cost would have been better spent on looking at a cold adapted strain of Neocotina, the weevil I showed you earlier. So in that case, you need to raise the awareness and make people understand of the, the issue of the invasion, which is a big step for Europe at the moment. Then you've got to provide the case for action, and that's a, a tough thing to do. Demonstrate action can be effective, and with a 30% success rate, maybe that's a bit harder, but also working with more experienced countries like New Zealand and Australia. And choosing the right target is important. So it could be the baby steps using something like a Zola weevil, which is distributed around the whole world, the whole, whole, whole world actually, um, or using an off-the-shelf agent, one that's been used elsewhere and we know is going to work. So working out the regulatory pathway is important because in many countries they don't have one and that, that really hits the buffers. Once you've got a country that doesn't know what it's doing and hasn't learned from other countries, then you've got to start from scratch. And these are very big principles to operate with under. Consider the Goya protocol and CBD. So do not assume that you can get organisms out of a country without a lot of a lot of hoops going through a lot of hoops and that's a, a real challenge and then don't over promise prepare for the long haul it takes a long time so i'm running out of time and i'm going to just move on to conclusions so yeah we have a massive advantage when it comes to collaborating between research and government 49 member countries who are all fully engaged in what cavi is up to you, it is possible to build a massive multi-country multi-partner multi-donor multidisciplinary program for plant health you wouldn't think it when you start off and it's pretty daunting but it is possible with enough resource and enough uh, commitment evidence-based policy making is the goal of most countries but getting in evidence and getting it into the right hands is hard but it's just got to take time um, you must adapt yourself to the regional conditions and cultural conditions otherwise you've got no chance and regular engagement is fundamental. Everyone feels forgotten if they haven't been contacted or advised or updated within a few months of whatever's happened. So those are my basic take home messages. Um, there's loads of information here uh, through the uh, links provided there. And of course, I must very sincerely thank all of our donors uh, without whom we would not be able to operate. And I will pass it back to you. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. Um, I, I'm going to take over to Q and A because Charles is uh, Charles's internet is a little bit dodgy at the moment. Okay. Um, but yeah, that was Dick. That was a fantastic, wide-ranging, and insightful um, across the practicalities and the politics of uh, uh, of of the plant health world from your perspective. So, um, if people would like to put questions in the Q and A, otherwise I've got loads and I will dominate. So uh, it's up to up to people to to, to cut me off at the pass. Um, so so we got a we got a, a question here um, coming in. So what do you see the balance between food security and protecting the natural environment as we as we move forward, presumably with thinking about climate change and population growth as well? Yeah, I think there's a lot more sympathy and understanding in the, the natural environment it, you know it is the source of all of our all of our resources originally um, and areas where they have protected it they have a bigger advantage um, in watershed management and everything else so i'm hoping it does move that way pesticide drift um, biodiversity reductions as we start to record more of it i think people become more and more aware of it and the average consumer wants to see sustainably produced foods and i think we are I think the groundswell is 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 moving in the right direction. I think um, some organisations hide behind consumer demand. They want perfect tomatoes. I don't think we do want perfect tomatoes. We want tasty tomatoes and we can cut the nasty bits off. I think we'd need to move more down that way and the, and the supermarkets are certainly heading that way too. So it is a balance, but I think the strength that we're moving away from, uh, we're moving more into the environmental and, and, and climate mitigation. Yeah. My tomatoes in my greenhouse certainly aren't perfect, so I, I have sympathy with that. Um, so another question here. So, so uh, look, thinking about invasives, uh, losses due to invasives compared to those endemics, is the investment, is the balance right? Uh, have we got the right proportion there? Hmm. I think that that's one of the most common questions we get. So you know, a pest's a pest. You know, if it's sitting on your whatever crop, it doesn't matter whether it's native or exotic, it's already there and it's causing a problem. With invasive species, the, the, the difference is they're always exotic and you can do something about them not arriving in the first place, sharing data between countries to say, fall army worms coming, get prepared. 
that that's a pretty valuable message. So that's that's where your bang for the buck is massive. Um, of course, once they're there, they're just another pest. So you're quite right. But sometimes the the measures you can use in the case of biological control. Let's say we did have a, hyper, a, a parasitoid for fall armyworm that's specific from South America. You could go in and control fall armyworm with a single release of, a, of an organism permanently, like we did with cassava mealybug, saving millions of people from starvation. So there are alternative approaches, but I'll, I'll tell you the investment in invasive species mitigation is less than 1% of what goes into traditional control of any pest. I mean, it's a tiny, tiny proportion. So I think the proportion is wrong, terribly wrong. And invasive species should get... When, when recent studies showed, recent 10-year-old studies showed the cost of, of climate change at the time was $1.3 trillion and invasive species is $1.4 trillion. Look at how much money goes into climate change versus invasive species when you've got more chance of getting a result, a faster result with invasive species is quite surprising to me. But right. I'm biased, I'm biased. Yeah, of course. Uh, so we've got a few more questions. Um, I, I, I'm going to try and keep to time because obviously people will be ducking in and out of the uh, of the sessions, uh, and so 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 we need to stick to the schedule. So uh, if we don't answer your question, I'll, I'll, I'll ask Dick if he would probably answer them, typing them in during the break, so that we we cover everybody's questions. But uh, a question here, which is a technical question: Are you taking into account mycotoxin mitigation strategies? Yes, we do. We do have some projects on um, on mycotoxins um, using AfloSafe Afl um, in Pakistan, in particular in cotton. So yes, there's means of detecting it and reducing it, and also applying a non toxigenic uh, fungi to prevent them. So displacing the the niche in which they would normally operate. So yes, we're, we're certainly paying attention to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And what and what about the balance? How do you see the balance between small scale agriculture in developing countries, where clearly that that's important and part of their own development and then land use in countries where you've got the high value uh, fruit and veg which they then export to developed countries yes we i mean cabby as a development organization is trying to play both parts we want to provide support to the smallholder farmers for which you know a massive proportion of food is generated through and they're the ones that are least supported i think the ones who receive who are growing high value tend to have a better institutional support and framework to help them grow so i'm i, I we would always focus on the smallholder farmers or collectives than you know uh, over the others because they tend to naturally because of the income have more support is, is my my instinct yeah, response yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, an academic question. Um, so uh, you referred apparently to buy pesticides as non-chemical. Uh, I can see where this is going. And this presumably is an important presentation issue in some places. Uh, yeah. so, so what's your view on the use of the term chemical in that context? I've fallen into a terrible trap, Chris. You're quite right. I apologise. I should never have said that. It's it's nature-based solutions. It's, uh, it's an alternative non-synthetic chemical. You're, you're quite right. Is that an issue, do you think, in presentation and acceptance from people? It is. It's a, it's a, it's a tough thing to get your head around. You know, the idea that, uh, and, and, uh, and, and you're quite right, you know, BT is the BT toxin. It's, it's generated by the organism rather than, the, you know, it could, might as well be stuck in a lab. So, yes, you're quite right. The, the presentational thing is important. People have hard enough, it's hard enough for people to understand what biopesticides are, let alone using the wrong terminology. So, yeah, it's, it's a very, so we, the bioprotection portal we we very careful about what wording we use. It's called a bioprotection product portal, um, rather than a biopesticide portal. And I think that was uh, that there was some uh, customer group interactions, what do you call it, when they when you talk to the people who might be using it, um, to learn about what it is they understood and what they wanted to have it called. So yeah, it's it's tough. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then uh, I've just got another question come up in the chat. I'm trying to manage two streams here. Uh, compliments you on your beautiful presentation. Uh, Question on the problem of general predators used in biological control in uh, insect pests. Wh which predator, looking at which predators have multiple preys to feed on, thereby limiting the effectiveness of biological control. So, so I suppose that's about the biology and, and the specifics mm. of, uh, of those. And you, you made some comments before about the choice of those pests mm. as well. I'm terribly biased. I'm a weed biocontroller and that doesn't happen. They're, they're specific to the weed and they don't tend to eat anything other than the weed. <clears throat> With insect agents, historically, there's been a broader host range and less testing, to be completely honest. So yes, you don't really want to have something that's having non-target impacts, of course, and especially on native species that might be valuable and that no one knows of being attacked. So that's quite a worry. Um, it's not about the efficacy. I think the yeah, I think the efficacy is driven by market and whether it works. So I think that's, that's a, a challenge. 
Um, but yes, I, I would always favor a specific agent over a oligophagous one, of course. Um, and sometimes the testing is hard. You know, you've got you know, testing things in the phylogenetics, phylogenetic process is easy for weeds. You know, you've picked them, you've got the phylogenetic tree, you grow the seed up and you put the insect in and see if it eats it. You have to grow the plant and the pest and the natives and the parasitoid. It's, it's a multi-trophic thing. It's a lot harder. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I, I think we've dealt with all the questions that actually came up. Uh, we're just about on time. Um, uh, just anticipating the next session, which will start at quarter past on the speed networking uh, session and, and some of the conversations about careers. What, in the area that you've talked about, and it's very broad, what, what, what's the careers for plant health specialists like in this area from your perspective? Well, within CABI, I mean, we're seeing growth in data, data management, data policy, biopesticides, biocontrol, of course, has always been a solid one for us. Um, and uh, the, the, the social science side, CABI had a relatively limited social science capacity, and we're growing that very rapidly because you have to prove impact, you have to prove and do it correctly. So the, those are areas internally, but obviously in the countries where we work, then, you know, trying to get people out of the cities back into the, into the farmland and getting younger folk involved in the process, you're seeing a massive exodus of youth in agriculture. I think the average coffee farmer in Colombia is 56 for average age, you know, this this is not a sustainable future for a massively important industry. So, uh, yeah, the, the, there are certain career paths um, internally and 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 externally.